What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Basim Hanna podcast. Today, we are very lucky to be joined by Karina Eskenderi, who's team lead of Eskenderi Real Estate Team. Um, actually, this is my first time meeting you, so we're going to be getting to know each other on camera. Love it. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, maybe we can start by you introducing yourself to me and the audience. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. This pleasure. is always awesome to do these podcasts and to even get to know you. So, uh, Karina, as you mentioned, nice uh, my you. team is the Escondaria Real Estate Team, a great team. And I've been in the resale or in the real estate industry for over 10 years now. Actually, I keep saying 10 years and it's been two years and I keep saying <laughs> 10 years. So about a decade. It's how my wife describes her age as well. She's, right? Yeah. She's yeah. 27 always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's been a wild ride. Amazing. Um, okay, right off the bat, things that I've noticed, uh, your team is all like uh, what I would describe as like boss bitches. Is that is that <laughs> so, by design? You know what's so funny? Everyone always says, oh, I love that you have a female team or, you know, that's that a woman-based team. And I actually didn't intend it for it to be that way at all. And it just kind of like, evolved into that okay. um so it's the it wasn't intentional i love it it wasn't intentional uh we do have like male presence in our media team and stuff like that right but your assistants yes but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Um, but yes we are um an all girl power team i mean that's much. amazing right now yeah okay well n i'm kind of like jumping ahead here but uh how is it to ha to be like a female like power voice in a pretty male dominated like industry am i a powerful female voice i don't know I mean, but listen. um thank you here you. i'll take yeah. <laughs> that as a big compliment um it's it's great i mean like you said i think as females in the industry there are a lot of stereotypes we have to fight um you know certain tv shows which i will keep nameless <laughs> kind of make even like I think make that stereotype more yeah like worse in a way right, right. and it creates like the different type of um how well, I can't even find the word like drama safe word to yeah. use no this is things. a this is a you can yeah. use whatever words you want here um but I think it's I think we're doing a great job and keeping our professionalism Definitely. and our knowledge. And I think that shines through when we're talking to our clients and portraying ourselves. And that's all I can ask for. Uh, I, amazing and kudos. Um, how many people are on your team? I have um, one, two, five, five, six. six. Yes. And do you guys work under... There's like, six of us, plus we have um, media. I, I know, are you guys like your own real estate brokerage, or are you under a... No, so uh, my brokerage is Union Capital Realty, but we run our own little independent team from within there. Okay, very cool, very yeah. cool. What did you do before you got into real estate? So my, I went to McMaster. Okay. Um, my degree was in biochemistry, oh. which is hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Using that every day to Yeah, I that. use my organic chemistry skills all the time. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I thought I maybe wanted to be a vet at the time. Oh, okay. And then I was singing. And then one day I just kind of said, I'm going to get my real estate license because I didn't even think of it as a potential career, but I realized it embodied everything that I love. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Like I just like boom, 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 got my license as fast as you possibly can. Yeah. And then just went straight into working for the builder on the pre-con side. Okay. Can, can we learn more? So that that's very connected to what I do. I'm, yeah. I'm a developer and I do pre-con sales. Um, what, can you say who you work for? Do you feel comfortable? Yeah, I, yeah. Mean, I mean, can I? I yeah, think so. I used to, I, it's nothing, no, no, I'm really happy I did. I worked for Millborn. Okay. Yeah. And what was it like working pre-con sales? When you, did you do it, actually? Like, what time period? Uh, 2013, mm -hmm. I think it was. Um, 2013 to 2014. Okay. And then it was not that long. I was there maybe, like, a bit over a year. Right. I launched a few projects mainly for uh, Menkes and um, 
I really liked it and I felt it was an incredible platform to learn about real estate, learn about sales, learn about the back end of a lot of different things, which is why pre con so prevalent in my business now. Right. So I'm so fortunate that I had that exposure. It was not for me in the sense of being like an employee. Right. Um, I just couldn't, um, that's just not how I operate. Entrepreneurial. Yes. Yeah. I, I just, I don't like being told I need to be there a certain time, certain days. Um, and I just, it just wasn't designed for my type of personality, but it was a great learning experience. And I think it put me so ahead when I like went off on my own. So this podcast is predominantly geared towards like primarily entrepreneurs and then yes. secondary and more prevalent these days. I'm trying to bring in real estate, especially because of what I'm doing personally. It, it's something that I'm fascinated with and I want to meet cool new people from our industry. Um, so you're in very good company here. Yes. Am I cool? Does that mean I'm cool? You're pretty cool. <laughs> you're pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure. uh, we'll find out. Like we're still <laughs> like, it's, it's like still early. minute five of the still interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you work for, for Milbourne, that's you do right. it for, for a year or two and then you're like, that's it. I need to start on my own. Yeah. I was thinking about taking the jump onto the resale side and, um, I was very hesitant you know, my confidence obviously wasn't there. And I was like, you know, I have a salaried position now. And what if I do nothing? Like, right. who's going to want to work with like a 20, how old was I? 22, 23, 23 year old. And trust me with like their real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I knew I wanted it so bad. And like, I had to do it then. Like if I was going to take the jump, it had to be then when I didn't have huge it, responsibilities. Like you say that and it resonates so much with me because that's how I was with my business. I, everybody's like, man, you started off so young. I'm like, well, if I, if I had a kid, you wouldn't do it. I would, I would have to work like yeah. I, because I have responsibilities. Right. But like, I, I remember I, the day my wife and I got married or the day I proposed to her, I told her I was quitting my job. That was very in line with me. So I was engaged during that time, got married, and my husband thankfully had like a stable yeah. job. And he was like, if you're going to do it, do it now. Yeah. And Marina was my sugar mama for like <laughs> two years. Yeah. <laughs> like, yo, we, one of us needs to make money. Yeah. I'm like, I'll try to I'm catch us up. I'm going to try this thing. Yeah, I'm going to try to catch us up. Um, so you do that and thankfully it's successful. And it's very scary, right? Because when you're out yeah. on your, like real estate is eat what you kill, right? Especially in like the resale market. So. Yes. Thankfully, you did well enough to yeah. like grow and do your thing. Uh, now, what do you like more, pre-sale or or pre resale or pre-con, or what do you do more of actually? I'm pretty 50-50, I would say. Like some years, like it shifts a little bit, but through like that decade of time, I would say it's been 50-50. Okay. Um, I really I like both, and I think it totally there's good and bad like with each of them right. right so with the resale side there's so much more emotional um elements that you need to deal with as a realtor right like there's because people's emotions are much more involved versus with pre-construction it's typically like 90 percent of the time mainly investors yeah and it's just very black and white on paper you want it or you don't yeah right it's Show like me my return it's, it's like, very simple the so there's yeah. no emotion attached to the process right which is a plus and a minus in a weird way because in the resale world like I feel like I actually develop relationships and I am a people person so I mm -hmm. do enjoy that aspect like seeing someone get a family home or like the excitement of right. all that stuff uh, but, but with pre-con it's much more like transactional um, and but I mean I like that too because I am a bit more that way myself. Like also, I can, you just like, you kind of need to put the numbers up, right? Like you, yeah, like I was just like, hey guys, this is the spreadsheet. Yeah, you want it or you don't. So right. do you? Um, right now, it's fifty fifty for your business. I'm obviously like asking for myself because again, like we're just getting to know each other right now, and I'm gonna try to get you to do pre sales for for my All building right. and on Shepherd <laughs> coming in September 2024. Here's a plug. Yeah, there's, there's a building a coming. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really nice building, <laughs> Bathurst and Shepherd. Um, what do you look for in terms of, or like what, how do you know that this is going to be a project that is going to be successful for, for like your investors or your, your buyers? Yeah. So th that I'm pretty picky about, like I definitely won't 
sell them just anything. Even if they come and say, hey, I really want this project, I'll be like, eh. Right. Like, so we definitely, so we want to vet, like, build a reputation. Okay. That's key to understand, like, what are the chances of this project succeeding um, and all of that. So that's a big one. We also want to check the location. Mm -hmm. What's coming here? Like, what are the potential returns? If we're banking on equity, let's just say, right. what has been seen here we like analyze the resale side and then we can try to make projections based on, oh, there's a new transit line, there's mm -hmm. a new school, there's a new this. Um, is the city investing money into this area? Right. right. So all those things with location. So it's it, an employment. Like we want to see who's going to, if you're an investor and you're going to rent it out, who's your tenant profile? Right. And what does that look like? Right. You said, so you asked kind of one of my, my leading questions first, which was that 90% of the people that buy pre-con are investors. Yeah. There's always this like this fallacy that 50% that, uh, are, are investors and 50% are owner occupiers. Is that fact or Definitely myth? not from my experience. And I'm yeah. saying that from both sides of the pond, right? Because I sold on the builder side, so I saw exactly who's buying it. Yeah. Um, and then on my own side. That being said, there are people who are buying it to live in but mm -hmm. the majority are investors okay so if but not it's not always just to, to, to preface because everyone thinks oh it's investors from overseas buying all that stuff no it's investors here actually like yeah. that's the majority it's the one family who saved some money and are able to buy an investment property and that's what they chose right it's not always like a big conglomerate yeah. Um, yeah, or like some machine. like you yeah. know, some guy from the Middle East or Asia. Exactly. There's or this whatever. perception or that I person, think some person. Yes. Is where the government likes to paint that picture, yeah. but it's always I find just really hardworking people that were able to make this investment happen. Um, okay, I'm gonna do. I had another question since you brought up government, the foreign buyers tax. Right. Like good or bullshit? I think it's a way to make people feel like they're doing something. Yeah. So bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the true problem. Yeah. Also, you can get around it. You like, can get around pretty it. Pretty easily. Um, and it's also not the problem. Like our crisis of lack of inventory is a lot to do with how they regulate building. Like it takes so long for people to get approval and there's so much red tape. And I think like there's this fallacy that the builders are just super greedy and because they create that picture, oh, they must have the money, but they have the most risk and the most yeah. skin in the game is the builder. And it's, you know, where they're putting 20%, they're putting millions and millions of dollars into this. So let me give it to you from the builder's you, yeah, side. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm gonna have my coffee, is that yeah, right? by all means. You just push the mic away so that it doesn't, like, Early. yeah. That's what I've learned from the, you know, faceless people behind the camera. Um, what the developer has to risk to get a building up and running. So one, we buy a land, we buy a piece of land that's unzoned. Say, I'll give you Shep, let's use Shepherd as the example. Yeah. We bought Shepherd in April, 2020. We took it through a rezoning process, an entitlement process that took three years. So for three years, we carried land where there's no income on the land. Like there's like, it's an old plaza. It barely covers itself. Like it's, we're putting out of pocket every year. Then, when we start, before we start construction, we have to go to very nice people like you and we have to sell 70% of the building um, and get deposits, 20% deposits. And it has to be a bunch of different, like there's different criteria, criteria right. to like make it a good lender or to make it a good purchaser. Then like Shepherd is going to cost $200 million to build. The bank's expectation, we're going to borrow $150 million from the bank to get it done. The bank's expectation is that we guarantee me and my partners guarantee $150 million of construction. So if anything goes wrong, if we have to go over, if anything, whatever, like we write checks out of our own pockets. And I don't know about most developers, but I don't have, like, if I miss, yeah, it's, I'm, it's, it's, I'm effed. That's what I mean. I think people don't realize that, which is so funny because you invest your money into stocks or a portfolio, right? If they screw up or that happens, yeah, you're just like, oh, that's Say what it is. Yeah. But then everyone wants to like jump down the throat of another form of investment, which is like the builder. So not that I'm saying that there aren't situations that are bad, which is why you have to choose uh, builders that you trust the reputation. Right. But I think, I mean, we digress from the foreign buyers tax, but I think that. No, I think we're done with that. Yeah. We, were, we already concluded <laughs> what that was. But yeah. the, the, I think the real issue is that the way 
that they're trying to make it sound for people is not solving the right issues. Right. Um, I tend to agree with that. Uh, what is your view on the current state of the pre-sale market, just pre-sale market? Um, I mean, I don't think it's a mystery. Like pre-con last year right now is quiet. Right. It's, it's pretty difficult to get people to buy pre-con right now. Um, but are you achieving some level of success? Yeah, there are people transacting. It's just not how it was. Like there's just very few of them. I think everyone's kind of tight with holding their money close to the vest. It's, it's an uncertain time, I yeah. think. Like people just in general are feeling uncertain. So while pre-con sales are happening, I think it has to be like a solid project, right? Like the good projects mm -hmm. still blew out, right? What, what's a... What's a the definition of a solid project like return wise it has to be a solid project i think it's like location so huge for people and price point you have to be priced correctly in this market and i think the projects that were priced aggressively mm -hmm. when they came out at launch are the ones that did well versus the ones that were priced a little bit high are trying to backpedal right now Which and offer tough... like incentives but they missed kind of that yeah, the you, boat where they should have maybe been priced a little bit more aggressively. Like your to, first impression is very, to very To help important. us, like as agents, make the sale, like we need to also believe in it, like, right? Like there has to be something in it for our buyer, our investor. Mm -hmm. And if we like can't really justify what it is, it's so much easier to like push them on a project that is within like their realm or budget. Okay, let me give you a, let me ask you an uh and this is really off the cuff now. We're 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 way past the like list of questions that we talked <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah, you haven't yesterday. even opened the questions. I don't even know I what saw those that are. Email. Yeah. None of the questions <laughs> have come. None up. of the, none of those are happening right now. Um, but I think this is a more valuable conversation. Yeah. Uh, let me let like t let's talk about me and my situation. I am a first time developer. I've partnered with uh, with a group called Brixen, who have built like seven or eight condos. They're really good, well known, very reputable. Um, and we're launching like our first co-development is Shepherd, and then we have three towers in Mississauga together. So, to like off of the right off the bat, I'm not a proven commodity, right? So right. how could I? And then Bathurst and Shepherd, it's a it's a decent location. It's next to Shepherd West Station. It's uh, like near Downsview and and mm -hmm. Yorkdale and like York University and all that stuff. So it's got like it's like the package yeah. and the marketing that we're gonna do for it. Uh, how do I get people to show up and like want to sign deals there? I think you kind of, you already did what you should have, which is partner. Right. Partner with someone who have has, to. have had a proven track record or else it's difficult. Yeah. Um, and pre-answer like the scary questions, which is like site plan approved, zoning's yes. done. Done. Right. Cause those are the things that will come up but if you're partnered with someone who's had a success story i think you just got to piggyback off of that mm -hmm. and then leverage all your information which is like all the doors you have the rental buildings right so right. that's sufficient you want to show them you have the funding to continue the project that's essentially is that really like the biggest fear yeah. that people have is that like you're gonna like put money in and then you're gonna get it back in three years with no return Correct. or something yes okay uh um, when it comes to like because when they're choosing like a Tridel or a Menkes, like Great Golf, like they know this is getting built. Right. Most likely. Right. right? Like this is not, like they haven't had cancellation. So like this project, based on For that sure. history, this is getting built. Okay. So that's really important to people because if they're choosing, if like take that one family who's that one time investor, that first time investor who saved this 20% to do this, mm -hmm. they want to make it count. Right. So if I put my 20% into a project with the fear that, this is not going to happen, mm -hmm. then I'm going to put it into a builder well. I know this is going to happen. Just de-risk a little. Right. Um, now, I think about creative ways where I can not just, like, tread water with the Menkees, Tridels, Green Parks of the world because I can't compete the way they compete. I have to come at it at a, like like everything else in my life. I'm a, I'm a startup guy. Like, every business I've ever done, I've started from scratch, very similar to you. So, like... How do you compete? So I think about it. I'm like, well, realistically, if I make the assumption that 90% of the people that are going to walk through that door are actually investors and not end users, what they really care about is two things, capital appreciation and cash flow, right? right? Most people 
don't have cash flow when they when they do these pre-construction sales. Like they expect that they're going to be losing money for the first two, three, four years. Right. Um, and then they really hope that the capital appreciation is going to come up. So if I give them an opportunity, and again, like I'm a rental building guy. Like my goal long term is not to be in condo development. It's, rental building. It's to build a community where a bunch of investors together can own these rental buildings. Like this is, uh, and the, like obviously the people are gonna be like, just go buy a REIT. Well, I'm like, no, because we want all the development profits that get made from building the building ourselves. And we wanna be able to, to like do this for ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I, like the broader first and second generation immigrant communities. I'm, I am one, I, I believe you are one as well. Uh, Either us or our parents came here and we had nothing right. and we figured out Canada up to this point ourselves. What I've realized is the next chapter of our collective success is learning how to work together, right? So I, I want to try to like bring that to the table, um, but I'm like maybe not on my first project because there's, yeah. it's like a lot of unknown. <laughs> I think a great incentive, if that's like one, I think one that people really like would be like um, a rental guarantee. Yeah. So a rental guarantee is helpful if you're trying to like push them to be cash flow positive for yeah. the first year, right? Like that's a good incentive for investors. Uh, and that's one I, I, I seriously think about, like, I'm like, why can't we offer that? You, the, 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 the secret is that you bake the rental guarantee into the price of, of the course. condo. Like yeah. that, like there, no, nothing is for free. Right. But it's just like some people offer, you know, free parking, free locker, free whatever. It's like, I'm baking in, this I'm baking the into the yeah. rental guarantee. Uh, okay, that's enough about pre-con. Uh, what is what keeps you motivated? Like, why do you do what you do? Like, you are an overachiever. Just like what I've seen from about you online, and even just meeting you now, like you can tell that you're not trying to live the average life. So, what keeps you motivated? I think for me, it's like my kids. My kids are my big reason, um, and wanting them to have you know, a certain lifestyle and to help provide for them and build like generational wealth for my future Favorite family. word, generational yeah, wealth. Right? Yeah, right? Like I think that's my biggest reason why. Also, like I'm, to be honest, I've just been like that since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Like if I, I don't know how that happened. Clearly some mental <laughs> situation. <Yeah. laughs> um, my parents were super normal and great, so it wasn't them. But like if I didn't get A plus or 100% of my test, yeah. I was like really upset. Oh, really? Like, I had to have, like, the best grade. I had to get on the honor list. I had to get, like, I've just been that way. So you're competitive. I'm, in general, a very, I know that about myself. I'm a competitive person. Um, but only in things where I know I could be good. If I know I suck at something, I'm like, right. oh, it's just for fun. But if I know if I have a chance, like, yeah. at doing it well, like, even in board games or games, like, I'm not a good person. I'm pretty ruthless even against my six-year-old. Really? Like, we played laser tag, and I did not go easy on him. I don't let my kids play. Uh, my, my kids win at Mario Kart. I'm like, you got to beat me. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like, like I'm that, sorry. too. There will yeah. come a day when you beat me, but yeah. it ain't today, son. Today, yeah. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> not today, Junior. Not today. Um, okay, so if just being competitive is what motivates you or, like, being an overachiever, which is kind of very different than me. I was, like, a bum growing up like I right. never wanted to do well in school but it's because I didn't care I guess it was one of those things I didn't care about you just didn't care I eventually cared about school and then I did well thank god but like the vast majority was, was like not. my parents like he's gonna be dependent on us forever <laughs> <laughs> oh there you proved them wrong yeah there that's true well I'm, I'm I hope they're happy <laughs> um okay what is like the new what's your next new challenge so I've been um diving more into actually like coaching and coaching agents and you know I started like a course kind of something that I was passionate about that I knew I could help help agents with which was like an Instagram how to use Instagram correctly right is the word not how to use Instagram um, for lead generation and from there I've kind of spun off quietly I guess it's my first time talking about it um like coaching oh, you heard it here first right coaching like one-on-one -on -one, and I'm kind of just doing that right now on the down low with a few uh, clients okay and then eventually I'm gonna bring that clients to scale. being other agents other agents yeah okay and then I'll eventually bring that to scale okay um, so Very that's cool. probably a new a new exciting chapter that I'm gonna be so can we can we talk into. about your social a little bit because sure. that's actually how I got uh, like 
directed towards you. It's right. like you are one of the, uh, you're, you overachieve in social. Let's put it that way, right? Sure. Like how many followers do you have? I don't have that many. I don't know. I mean, like 12,000 or something. That's not nothing. But it's, I mean, there's people sticky. that have way more. That's not, I mean, it's not a. Yeah, but those, like, the follower count's important. But, but I it's don't, like, but I've never bought a follower. Like, those are genuine followers. Because, and you can tell that because your reels. My get engagement's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. like, you, you get a lot of, like, views and likes and comments right. versus, like, somebody that has 100,000. And then you've seen, like, 500 same. views. So you yeah. know it's not. It's BS. BS, yeah. Okay, so what can you, uh, can you give, what's, like, your best tip or, like, your biggest secret? Not that we're, like, go for the coaching <laughs> and, like, don't give us, like, all yeah, the secrets, of but. Like for a guy like me, like I have like 35, 3,600 followers. Um, I just started doing this a year ago. Part of the reason I do this podcast is to like increase that following as well. Also to give back to the broader entrepreneurial community and the real estate world. Um, for somebody like me in my position, like you, you evaluate and you're like, you could do this thing better. I think, I mean, not for you specifically, um, but in general, I think people post the wrong content for their audience. So they're not, they don't think of it as a true potential lead source. Mm -hmm. So when you don't think of it as a lead source, like what you post on your Instagram, would you send that to your potential investors? Like that's what you have to ask yourself. That's a good question. Do you get yeah. what I'm saying? And I think a lot of times agents don't, or anyone who, ha who uses, who wants to use social as a form to build like a lead source, mm -hmm. they don't think, if I was going to post something, I asked myself, would I pay 4,000 bucks to drop this on my flyer? Right. Would I put this on my billboard? Right. And if the answer is no, it's probably not a value piece of content. Do you, are you a believer in quantity over, maybe not over quality, but like quantity matters? Um, I believe consistency beats ability. Okay. So I think consistency beats ability. That's for sure. But like consistent in in doing things properly right. so you have to do it right but do it consistently because t someone who's top of mind will win over someone who's more capable I, I couldn't agree more with that and and I've learned that by accident um, so I've had in the last I've been doing this for 12 15 months I've had five social media managers um, all because of me. It's my fault. Like I keep, I, I'm not a good client to have because I get distracted by my non-social media job, which requires me to like do things, do things <laughs> that to like, All right. yeah, <laughs> what's that? Yeah. Um, but, uh, the last person that I, I used, uh, or the last couple that I've used, they were like, no, we're going to consistently post at the right time at like right. this and this. And, and I noticed that like in all walks of life, people would stop me and they'd be like, hey, I recognize you from social. And I'm like... That's right. That, that's a very weird feeling. You have to you have to be consistent. You have to understand that Instagram algorithm over the bit, a little bit, which is like posting at the same time or whatever it is. Yeah. And that will help push, push your posts or feed into people more consistently. Do you have somebody that stays on top of posting for you. I do it all. Do it all yourself. Man, it I'm a is, little bit I'm a little bit like controlling. It's with so that. hard to be consistent. Yeah. Like it is It's tough. It's not I already a have joke. anxiety because I didn't post today. We'll, we'll, post we'll take one a right picture. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it right it. after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That is that is kind of cool on the social stuff. Do you want to talk more about your coaching? Because I am kind of interested about that. Like is there uh, is there a specific type of client that you would want to engage with or like who who is the best person to take your course maybe not just like any real estate agent but like right what are the prerequisites that you would like have to interview and say like you know what we're gonna vibe we're gonna do well together versus like maybe like go brush up or like go take it more seriously and come back to me um I mean I, I do ask a bunch of like pre-qualifying questions before okay because it does require like my one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. um, but I think the biggest thing is I want to know someone's actually gonna do what I'm saying right. versus come to me complaining when they didn't implement what I've suggested right right so I can kind of tell that just from how someone explains the way they are the way they like that that's kind of the biggest thing is if we go through this and I'm dedicating my time to your success, like I can't want you to succeed more than you. Very true. Right? So I need to feel 
that I'm going to do what you're saying and implement all of this into my business. Mm -hmm. And then that way I can actually measure using the metrics that I have in my coaching platform. Well, why didn't it work? Right. Well, you didn't do this many calls that you were supposed to this day or that day. So I, I do use metrics for my coaching. It's not broad. Like there's an actual six month program. Have you taken somebody all the way through your six not month yet. program? Not yet. I'm, I'm fresh. I'm like on month two. Oh, so this is very yeah, exciting. It is new, exciting. new, new. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to shift gears completely. Uh, with, do you ever do leasing or rental services yeah. for your clients? Uh, so you have experience with the whole like residential tenancies act. Yeah, our team handles everything. What is your view on the residential tenancies act? Oh, I'm not the best person. <laughs> to ask this you might be <laughs> um based on that expression i feel genuine rage and fury okay why so do i but i just okay. need other people to hear this because i feel it like it is I absolutely rant. absurd that if i go steal a 50 dollar thing from a store i get penalized but i can go rent months without paying rent and not have the same persecution like the fact that it is so, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there are, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that there aren't landlords that might take advantage of the system, but I think we've totally flipped now and the Residential Tenancies Act really, really protects the tenants. Like it's not towards the landlord's favor right. at all. And like coming from the perspective, obviously of a landlord myself, I think it's ludicrous the amount of, uh, lengths that a landlord needs to go to for someone who is straight up not paying, ruining their property, going against the lease. Like maybe what the, the what needs to happen is more support on the like landlord tenant board to move things along faster. Right. Right. Um, but even if like, even if I think it's like, I think it's really one sided and there needs to be some adjustments made for the people that have worked their whole life and worked really hard to try to get this investment property for their kids, for their future, yeah, right? And I think the problem is, like I said, people think people who have a rental property are like, oh, they can yeah. afford it. Like Scrooge McDuck. That's not yeah. the case. Like people, they need those payments to maintain a lot. Mo most people, like they can't. They need that. Or you can do it one month, two months. That's it, but they need the rental income. Yeah. Like right? if you go to landlord tenant, like if you go to landlord tenant Wait, board, eight months to kick somebody out, and the, and then you don't get to collect what what you've lost, like right. or it's very hard. You have to take them to small claims court, yes. and then you're usually dealing with somebody who has doesn't financial have the problems. ability exactly. So you're like it's like throwing good money after bad. Yeah, it's a tough situation. It's a tough, it's a, so yeah, I'm I'm I think it's too one sided. Yeah. I do think that there needs to be some protection for the tenants as well. So I'm not I want to be clear, like I'm not saying that because there can be yeah, you'll uh, get hate you get like hate spam oh, yeah. if you don't write that caveat into this. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah. yeah. So when you're editing, please make sure I make yeah, that yeah. very clear. <laughs> um I think the tenants should be protected as well because there are fantastic tenants out there that shouldn't be taken advantage of. Ninety five percent of tenants exactly. are amazing. But Landlords should also not be taken advantage of. Yeah. And I think the, the Residential Tenancies Act, currently as it stands, is really one-sided. I, I, would, I wouldn't even mind if the Residential Tenancies Act was like, okay, if you miss 60 days of payments, you can change locks automatically. Yeah. But if you're a bad landlord, there's like some equal consequence to you. And, and it, like they can put a lien on the property. Exactly. You know, or something yeah. like that where like, there has to be a better balance yes. of, of what's going on. I think there should be repercussions for the landlord 100%, but also equal repercussions towards non-payment of rent, trashing of the property, like all those things, I, right? I, I've been a landlord. So I do a lot of property management in Ontario. I've done property management in Florida, Arizona, um, a little bit in Texas. The states, man, it's like if you're day 31... Like, you don't need anything. You just kick them out, throw their stuff on the street, and, like, it's gone. Not yeah. that that's what you want to do, but having that power at least puts accountability on the tenant yes. as well as yeah. the landlord to, like, come to the table, make arrangements. It's there's a, not even, like, any interest. Like, there's nothing. No. There's no. nothing. They're, they're, you're incentivizing people to... 
Like, if I can't pay my rent, what are you going to do? You're going to file an N4, then you're going to wait 14 days, then you're going to go put an L1 into place. That's going to take another, like... If you file one thing wrong on that paper... Oh, it's over. Restart. It's over. Restart. Yeah. <laughs> Back to go. <laughs> Back yeah. To <laughs> so, the, okay, so, again, if you are going to file those forms, make sure you use professionals. Yeah, paralegals um, are... Paralegals They're to worth do their that. weight in gold. Yeah, not yeah. us. Use legit paralegals to do that. No, well, like, even myself, if somebody asks me to manage a property on their behalf, I'm... I have a team, including yeah. a paralegal, but I'm not. That will deal with the forms. Yeah, like I'm not a lawyer. I, I, that's yeah. a that's Make a sure tough you have thing. to make sure it's perfect, or you start from scratch. Maybe I should go to my questions list. Like, what's uh, sure. what's happening here? Oh, okay, I got one for you. What's the biggest professional mistake you've made in your life, and what has it taught you? I think in the beginning of my career, I didn't treat this business like a business. So that was a big mistake. And because I wasn't managing like my CRM at all, or mm -hmm. like I didn't have the confidence in like going back to clients or anything like that, I probably missed out on so many potential referrals and relationships where like they've they've moved on and it's totally my fault because I didn't I didn't have a proper system. You didn't keep it warm. I didn't keep up. warm, I didn't follow up. Like I just didn't simply just did not have a system in place. Right. Um, and I think a lot of that also comes with confidence. I find like new agents like are just not confident with those types of relationships mm -hmm. um, that they fail to keep them. Right? So that's something that totally transformed my business was once I had a business plan and actually had set targets of what I'm supposed to do, like laid it all out. Okay. Um, 10 years from now, where are you? Where do you see yourself? Oh, on a beach. <laughs> um, no. Making passive income? Yeah, 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 that would be ideal. I mean, in the future, my 10 years from now, I realistically will still probably be grinding away. Um, five years. Okay, let's go five years. So sure. we're not talking retirement. Yeah, I'm sure I won't be retired in 10 years. I hope not. Yeah. Um, but in It's not at all it's cracked up to be. I, yeah. I did it once. It sucks. Really? Yeah, it's <laughs> not. I went through depression when I retired. Really? Interesting. It's like, uh, uh, I feel like we have this in common. We're, uh, you have to be doing something. I, I need purpose in my life, and I'm uh, extremely competitive, and um, I don't do things for money, but money is an excellent scorecard. Yeah. Right. So when I, I know I'm doing things right, when because usually people will uh, you're rewarded. For you're, yeah, you're compensated you're doing, for right? it. But I, I also don't really care that much about money anymore. I'm doing it for I think the community thing is a very important thing. Um, and it's on our generation to build up. Right. Like future generations. Um, but yeah, like what is the like do you want to own your own brokerage i like i, I see coaching is, is in your future yeah. do you want to lean more into that yeah, more into yeah i probably will so in the next 5 years i I'll, I'll most likely lean a lot more into the coaching element of the okay. business um be a little bit more hands off and remote in regards to like physically being like maybe not doing the listings like not like yeah not being so managing uh like more of that aspect so i w my vision would be for my team to be super strong and and grow and have a really substantial market share okay um and then i can manage more like we have a listings manager that's dealing with x region and buyer specialist in this region which is we're doing that on on like what i call a small scale now right. but to eventually just really take over a large portion of okay the city or GTA. Um, okay, one last question and then I'll let you go. Uh, and thank you so much for being generous with your time today. Yeah. Uh, do you do any personal investing? I do. What do you put it into? Um, What's your portfolio so look like? So far, I mean, I have like pre-cons okay. mainly. I have like stuff in like an American fund for yeah. rentals and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but pre-con, I guess, would be my answer for what you're saying. I mean, yeah. that's a great investment. It's worked really well up to and including this point. Yeah, I mean, I think pre-cons, like, I think re you have to always, when people are asking what's the best one to go with, mm -hmm. I think it totally depends on the person. If you have the funds right now and you are you can close, you have the mortgage, then go with the resale. Right. It's right, you're going to potentially get it's less, dollars less per price foot. per square yeah. foot, you start paying that off now. So like that would be my answer depending on someone's requirements, their portfolio and their goals. But if you're, hey, 
I have some lumps of money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to just put it into stocks. I want to put it into real estate, but I don't want to take or can't take on a mortgage right now. Right. Then pre-con is your answer. Right. Right. So it just... Just it, make sure they have an assignment Of course. Well, not even... You also want to make sure this person's going to be able to close. Right. Like, I'm not going to sell a pre-con to someone who has no potential chance of closing in four or five years. Right. Like, they only have enough to put that 20% yeah, down. Yeah, of course. That, that would just be... Why would you do that? So yeah. you want to pre-qualify. While you don't need to be getting the mortgage tomorrow, you need to pre-qualify to get that mortgage. For sure. Right? In the four years that it comes. Or else you're selling nothing. Right? Yeah, nothing's yeah. closing. No one's. Nothing's happening. Um, okay. Final question. I promise. This is the okay. one. Advice for people that see this and want to follow in your footsteps. This is for the entrepreneurs out there. The entrepreneurs. The, the little use. The little use. Okay. Little me's. Um, have a business plan, and I think having a coach is. I had a coach, and I think that was not a coach. I had mentorship. Yeah. I should say because I was on a team. I think having mentorship is critical um, to your success and don't get caught up in splits or whatever that is because something is better than zero of nothing. True. And I think you need um, that mentorship to really help you know how to move forward in whatever you're, whatever you're doing, whether it's real estate, mortgages, building, like yeah. learn from others and absorb as much information as you can. And I think confidence is the absolute most important tool in anyone's any, anything. They should have a course on just confidence. Yeah. If you're and conf sales. Sales and confidence are yeah. the most important things you can wear, the most important skills you can have, and they will take you far ahead than anyone who's smarter than you. A any of that. You will win if you are more confident. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, well, Karina, thank you so much for taking the time to come be here today. It was really a pleasure to get to know you. Yeah, this uh, is fun. Thank you. And I hope that we get to do business together in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish you all the best of success Thank and you. I hope that your coaching career goes just as successfully as everything else that you've done in your life. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the iconic tower. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll name it soon. Yes. It's, it's that's to it. be named. To yeah. be named. TBD. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey everyone. Well, that's another episode of the Bassam Hanna podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you want to see more full-length episodes, you can go to basimhanna.com. That's B-A-S-E-M-H-A-N-N-A.com. We're also on all the social media platforms on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Until next time, have a great day.